Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us to today's University of Rhode Island College of the Environment Life Sciences Learn at Home webinar brought to you by Cooperative Extension. Today's topic is all about tomatoes plant to plate. Next slide. So as I said, this webinar and all of the other webinars we've offered um, in this series are brought to you by Cooperative Extension. And in case you aren't familiar with what Extension is, we are the arm of the land grant university, which is University of Rhode Island here in Rhode Island. We're responsible for bringing science out into communities and to individuals to help them solve problems. We've been doing this for over 100 years, not me personally, but um, helping folks solve problems uh, originally around food and agriculture topics, but now we address all kinds of environmental and social issues. And so there's something for everyone and we encourage you to connect with us. Next slide. Um, also, I should mention that my name is Kate Venturini and I've um, been an extension educator for the last 15 years and I'm very grateful to do the work we do, which really, as I said, centers around bringing great information that is science based out to communities and to mention it because it's very important right now we um, have a few guiding principles, one of which is uh, we believe in social justice and we're really committed um, to making sure that this type of information is available to everyone. And these webinars have been a great way for us to make sure that info is getting out to people who might not be able to join us in person. So thanks again to all of you who are here now and who are joining us after the fact on the recording. Next slide. So just a few housekeeping um, items before I introduce Tom. We have a survey that you'll be sent as soon as the webinar is over, if you're here live, and we really, really appreciate you filling that out, mainly because one of the things we always do is attempt to measure the effectiveness, effectiveness of our um, educational programs on folks' knowledge, and um, we attempt to measure whether or not what we've shared with you will help you change your behavior for the better um, regarding environmental protection. So thank you in advance for filling out the survey. And a very popular question is, my, my friend was not able to join you and Tom today, so how can they catch up uh, with what they missed? Good news is we have a YouTube channel, Google URI Cooperative Extension YouTube, and you'll find the Learn at Home series there. This webinar will be uploaded um, before August 2020, and it will also be closed captioned. Um, and so we encourage you to access it if you have questions that you don't remember the answer to after. So that's all for me. I'm going to uh, be back at the end to monitor the Q&A, um, but I would like to introduce my friend and colleague and URI Master Gardener from the class of 2010. 10. Wow. Um, Hoagland, take it away, Tom. Well, thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Hoagland. Uh, first time presenter, so bear with me, but long time uh, organic gardener. I've been growing vegetables probably close to 40 years. So I've made almost every mistake possible, but I've learned a lot too. So that's the point of here. That's why I guess why Kate asked me to do this is that uh, in addition to the slides, which are full of great information, uh, I'll add my own uh, my own anecdotes and my own take on some of this stuff, and hopefully that will be helpful to everyone too. So that being said, um, a lot of the early slides uh, are really not germane any longer. Uh, this presentation it, it was probably designed to be given in the spring. You'll see a lot of stuff about planting and seeds. It's kind of late in the year to do much with that now, but um, next year is coming, and this video and um, presentation will be up so you can review it when winter is over and we're ready to go again next spring. So uh, the tomato ingredients, I, my addition here is that what the above equation leaves out but is vital to the success of your, those is the all important interest, care and observation of the gardener. That is truly the magic ingredient in growing, harvesting and eating your own homegrown tomatoes, indeed any vegetable. So you're a, an important link in having a success in your garden. 
Um, so here, it's kind of too late for seeds this year, but another spring will be here before you know it. Tomatoes start from seed very easily as opposed to some other vegetables like peppers, eggplants, or parsnips. They need soil warmth, humidity, water, and light, all of which you find in a greenhouse, but not so much inside your own house in early spring, when ideally you should start your plants. I tried to grow tomatoes from seed for years, but have given it up because I'm always disappointed with the results. I prefer to buy my plants, preferably at the Master Gardener plant sale in Maine. Also, if you grew tomatoes, especially of the cherry or grape variety in your garden last year and didn't always pick them when ripe and they fell to the ground, you may find some volunteers growing in June after the soil warms up. Sometimes I let these grow just to see what kind of tomato results. You won't get many fruit and these babies may not be true to last year's parent, but it's one of those fun experiments I like to do. So again, this, this one is uh, kind of like past its prime, but um, the last bullet point about single point packs or multi-packs, um, singles could be patio type plants. Usually they're determinate, which we'll cover in a bit, while multi-packs you can divide and plant directly in the soil. Buying single plants gives you more variety. Choose from slicers, paste tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes, etc. Buying six packs of the same variety plant are almost always too much of a good thing, unless you have a big garden and you're going to produce a lot of sauce. It's hard to discard a plant or three, so people tend to plant them all, which can lead to overabundance and the dreaded tomato fatigue. Um, note that resistance here is not equivalent to immunity. In areas where these problems have occurred in the past, even disease-resistant varieties may encounter some difficulty attaining full growth and production. For that reason, it's recommended that home gardeners follow a crop rotation schedule, meaning move the location in the garden where you plant and avoid planting tomatoes or other members of the nightshade, potatoes, peppers, etc., in the same location more than two years consecutively. Now, I've been experimenting along these lines myself. My vegetable garden plot is 11 years old, and uh, because my garden plot plants were exhibiting early blight symptoms, which we'll also cover in a bit, as early as mid-July, and I was having to spray a fungicide every week or two to retard its progress and keep my plants foliated, I removed my tomatoes last summer from the vegetable garden and put them in two-by-two -two wooden boxes and large pots and utilized new clean topsoil for planting. The fungus that causes early blight will ultimately defoliate your plants, and it remains in the soil for years particularly if you also grow other members of the tomato family, like eggplants and potatoes. So this experiment has worked very well, and my, my tomatoes look much better than they did, and I may attempt to return my tomatoes to the garden plot after a couple more years, or not, because tomatoes do take up a lot of room, so I have room in my garden for other things now. So here are the disease resistant codes. This is a lot of information, a lot of science-based information. Um, you can look at the tag. Uh, the, my experience is I don't usually have these diseases. I usually get early blight and bugs, but not any of these, but it's still possible. So the information is here for you. Uh, most plants offered for sale are disease resistant. Um, Early blight that I've referred to is a common tomato disease caused by the fungus Alternaria solani. It can affect almost all parts of the tomato plants, including the leaves, the stems, and the fruits. The plants may not die, but they will be weakened and will set fewer tomatoes than normal. Early blight generally attacks plants, older plants, but it can also occur on seedlings. Stressed plants or plants in poor health are especially uh, susceptible. Uh, what happens is the lower leaves of the plant starts to spot yellow or black, and, and then the whole uh, leafing branch becomes uh, yellow and dry. And it, because it's a fungus, the spores will spread upwards. So what I suggest strongly is as soon as you see this happening on those lower leaves, remove them. Whole branches are best. So even those branches at the bottom are usually pretty big and long. Sometimes the, the light will just start on the outside, but as soon as it's on a branch, it's in the vascular system of that branch. Take it off, get rid of it. Don't put it in the compost pile. Don't put it anywhere near your garden, just discard it. Uh, this is a little bit of description of uh, the various types of plants. 
it's kind of self-explanatory. Um, my notes here is like all tomato plants, I'm a big fan of support. Uh, cherry and grape plants can grow as large as 10 to 12 feet and they need to be supported so the fruit stays off the ground. And even the large slicing varieties, Rutgers, et cetera, they get so, if, if things are going well, the fruit gets so heavy that it's really hard to use stakes. And if you don't use a stake, then it's uh, gonna sprawl all over the ground. So we'll get to this in a bit, but I like cages and other very strong structural supports for the tomatoes. More, this is the third major type, the paste tomato. The fruit size of this is larger than a cherry, but much smaller than the slicers. Uh, personally, one paste, a couple of cherries, and two or three slicers each year. I used to grow more, but they went to waste. So I'll cover that as well. And that's a common mistake. You have these plants, you plant them, and then you end up with way too many tomatoes. Okay, determinate tomatoes. Um, these are ones that you see people put on patios in pots or in bags. Um, I don't tend to grow them, uh, but it's certainly an option. Uh, you can see the characteristic here is that uh, they do stop growing when the fruit sets on the top terminal bed. Um, and usually no pruning is necessary as opposed to the indeterminate. So if you're looking for a patio plant, then check these uh, types down at the bottom and uh, look for a determinant tomato for that uh, uh, use. Indeterminate tomatoes. So read the bullet points because that's certainly characteristic. My notes are, in my experience, I found that most plants offered for sale in garden centers and even at our master gardener sale are of the indeterminate variety. These plants require a bit more attention and maintenance than do determinate varieties. And we'll cover more on that later. Uh, there's another one of these slides that it's kind of too late this year, but um, I do have some notes on this for you. Tomatoes are easy to grow from seed, but proper timing is essential in order to avoid leggy, weak plants that result from germinating the plants too early. Consult the last frost date for your area. Consider that to be the planting date and count backwards from that to determine your ideal germination date. If your planting date, say, is May 30th, which is safe for Rhode Island, especially in these recent springs, um, that would mandate germination date no earlier than April 25th. Don't make the mistake of starting them in February or March because it'll be very difficult to get them in the ground and get any production from them. Uh, like I said, our maize for the last few years have been wet and cold, not good tomato growing conditions outside at all. Planting too early, even if the plant survives, will often result in weaker, stunted plants that can be subject to disease and pests. It's better to wait. Um, this, uh, my wife pointed out that hardening off needs a little bit more description. Uh, hardening off means uh, to have, enable the plant to transition from those lovely conditions inside a greenhouse to living outside in mother nature. So um, the idea there is while it's sunny and warm, you put the plant uh, when you've just gotten it out in the sun, but then when it starts to be cold or windy, you bring it inside and protect it. Personally, I have a shed uh, on the north side of my garden, so I harden purchase plants off by leaving them in the pots and placing them on that side of the shed uh, in indirect sunlight and then moving them into, into the shed at night. It takes about five to seven days, depending on the weather. Now we get to the fun stuff, putting it into the garden. Um, these are all good tips. Uh, I like to do almost all my planting, be it flowers or, or vegetables, after a rain or just before a rain. It, it cuts down on the watering. It makes uh, it a lot easier to do that. Again, there's a repeat here of uh, uh, don't put tomatoes in the same place where you had them last year because disease tends to accumulate in the soil. Um, so we have another slide. So note how these plants are spaced. 
two feet between plants is good. They look small now, but trust me, by June and July, they get really big. So resist the urge to crowd your plants because you bought too many. Pick the strongest ones from the six pack and generously give those extras to your neighbor. Too many tomatoes in August is always a problem. So this is a great slide. I only learned this technique myself a few years ago, but I always do it now. Be sure to loosen the soil around the roots and gently spread them out a little before you plant. If you are planting on a sunny day and not immediately after a rainstorm, be sure and fill the planting hole with water. This will reduce planting shock. If it doesn't rain the next day or two, be sure and water every day until the plant becomes established and no longer wilts. You'll be able to see if the plant is established and starting to grow on its own. This last tip is a good one too. Uh, so you, as you're planting, you tend to uh, mound it up a little bit around the plant. And then last step is just use your finger or your tool and make a little circle, an indentation around the stem. And uh, that helps to retain water if indeed it does rain. I'm a big believer in mulch. Um, weeding is really important, but it's boring. And it can easily get away from you, especially when the weather warms up, because the weeds grow faster than anything, even tomatoes. They grow faster than tomatoes. Mulch is the answer for the weeding nightmare. I've used grass clippings and mostly finished compost in my time, but now I've become a fan of red plastic mulch. And here is a picture of those very same uh, two by two wooden frames and the red mulch that I put down and my commit all and my cages. This is actually my tomatoes here. So this is why I like the plastic mulch keeps the weeds down. It warms the soil. Uh, the science is unclear yet, but apparently um, the success with the red mulch is it reflects the right uh, uh, UV light back up on the on the plants. Not sure about that part, but so you can use black plastic or any other color. Well, not clear, but you should use black or red because it's a good barrier for the weeds. So um, when planting, so uh, sorry, my, these are my two by two tomato boxes at the edge of my yard. They're located nearly 30 yards from the vegetable garden. I plant them in the center of the box in clean soil and I cut two lengths of red plastic mulch and place on either side of the stem I tack down the outside edges with earth staples or rocks. And then I take my tall tomato cage almost immediately after I've planted and put down the mulch and put it right through the mulch and around the plant. It tends to keep the mulch in place. So, because plastic will blow, obviously. But the method works. So we get into more science here. Um, most of you have heard of pH. Um, tomatoes are heavy nitrogen uh, feeders and they usually they naturally grow a lot of foliage. If your plants are not growing large with a lot of leaves and the color is tending more to light green or even a little yellow, it is likely they are in need of additional nitrogen heavy fertilizer. So again, my wife pointed out that side dress may need a little uh, definition. So. Side dress means to scratch the soil around an already planted tomato at around six inches from the stem, all around the stem. Sprinkle fertilizer, not too much, around the plant and then rake the soil back over and water. That's a side dressing. More on that. This is what uh, when you see these, this location, this 51010 or 15500, that's what that means. Nitrogen is always the first digit, phosphorus the second, and potassium the third. Uh, come on, there we go. Really important for tomatoes since they're almost all water with a little sugar. Uh, Got to be consistent. A lot of plant problems that we'll cover later slides are, are definitely due to water or lack thereof. So it's important to water. Uh, soaker hoses and irrigation systems are ideal to achieve the results from the bullet points in the slide. 
but they're not required. I don't have either. I water either in the evening or early morning, and I do try to direct the water to the base of the plant. But mulch really helps to keep the soil moist during hot and dry spells. Um, and uh, the, the part about not wetting the leaves, that last bullet point is important too, because most problems of tomatoes are fungus based. So fungus thrives with dampness. And that's why it's important to try to keep the leaves dry, as difficult as that might be. So a lot of information here. Um, I think there's the most important is that first item is that don't use garden soil, use commercial potting mix. But these do tend to dry out a little faster than garden soil. So you got to keep watering. Now we get to the fun stuff. Now we're really in, in July or June at, anyway, because now we got to we got to stake and support our plants because they're going to get really big. So what I always do, the best time to stake or trellis your plant is within a week or so of planting before the plant really begins to grow. If you wait too long, you risk breaking some branches as you try to corral them with ties. Tomatoes grow very rapidly in June and July and diligence is required in tying the plant to the stake before the growth gets away from you. Because tomato plants become so heavy when the fruit forms, both stakes and ties have to be strong. Um, so you look for strong wooden stakes or metal stakes, and you can see in the picture, that's a big strong tie to keep that on there. There's all sorts of varieties out there and ways to tie your tomatoes to the stakes. But the important thing is you see how heavy that fruit looks is that once it gets to this side, you have to do it almost every eight, 10 inches just to keep the stem from bending over and breaking because it will break from the weight of the uh, tomatoes. So uh, I used to use stakes, now I use trellises. Um, my note on this is all of these are true and one more thing. If you let your plants sprawl and grow as they are inclined to do, you will have a mass of foliage and it will be hard to get to and find your ripe tomatoes, which is the goal, right? It will not be a problem, however, for pests like rodents and slugs, and they will happily eat your fruit under cover. Like I said, I'm a cage fan. All one has to do once the cage is in place is occasionally reach in and lift a branch that is trying to escape and prop it, prop it on the next highest level of the cage to keep it growing up and not out. It also, the cage also helps to support a heavy fruit load. And you saw from the earlier picture, I used these big square cages. I'm a fan. The, the flimsy ones that are sort of like a cone, I find them, uh, they get overwhelmed by the tomatoes. Um, toward the end of the season. So I, I used to have them, don't have them anymore. So um, here's me standing uh, in early July when I took this slide next to my caged persimmon tomato, an indeterminate slicer. Today the plant is, today, the plant is six inches taller than me and I'm five nine. There are 12 tomatoes growing and ripening on this plant as of today. More will form and ripen before mid-September when the plant begins to slow down. At that point, because there's probably a series of uh, tomatoes at different sizes, all green, some maybe turning color, is that's plenty. And when it's, eh, say, September 15th or so, maybe September 21st, uh, snip off the top of the plant uh, and let, because it'll keep sending out more flowers right until frost finally kills it. So we want to discourage more uh, tiny little green tomatoes that we can't use by cutting off the growing tip and letting the plant concentrate on maturing the tomatoes it's already formed. So my comment here, uh, fourth bullet point, one to two stems is ideal, but it will take ruthless dedication to achieve that result. I usually end up with four or five because I've missed a couple leaders that got too too big, were high up on the plant with strong stems, and I don't have the heart to, to snip them off because at that point they have fruit. So I'm like everybody else. It's it's hard for me to get rid of 
fruit when I anticipate having them on sandwiches and in salads later on. But if you can do it, try to keep it to one, two, three stems. So I took this slide to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So if you look down at the picture, you'll see main stem, that should be obvious. And then left and right, you'll see leafing branches. And right there in the node, always on the top, the ad axial, the top surface, you'll see what we call suckers. And they always go off the stem at the leafing branch at an angle of about 45 degrees. Now, um, the two little suckers in this picture on, are on either side of the central leader. It's not always that way, but that's what you look for. These two are probably only two to three days old because the suckers grow very rapidly this time of year. Um, and they require diligent, almost daily surveillance to keep the plant from growing out of control. And I, I did film a two minute video on pruning these things, but we're not sure if my computer can handle the uh, bandwidth for it. So uh, it will be available when this presentation is up on the, um, on the web. But so there's a good illustration of suckers. Now, the other points on here to, that were covered in the video that are not uh, covered in this slide is that in addition to where you see them coming off here, uh, about this time of year in July, often the plant will send off a sucker right at the soil line from the stem. If you look down, you'll see instead of that main stem, which should be thick already, you'll see a couple of other stems coming right out of the ground. They're suckers as well. I prune them off because I'm, I'm trying to achieve a central leader. Think a tomato tree. That's what you're after. And then the other point I make is I, I had a great plant that I took the video on because I let it go for a week or two. So up on the top, you'll see I, I illustrate some really big lead, uh, suckers that got away from me and I've turned them to new leaders. And there you can't even snip them off with your finger and thumb anymore, you have to use a clipper. So tomato wants to grow lots and lots of suckers and new leaders. And your goal is to not encourage that. Because if you have a strong central leader and good strong leafing branches, then you'll get bigger fruit than if you let it go topsy-turvy like it wants to. Here's our plant that I'm going to demonstrate pruning techniques on. First, a definition. This is the stem of the central leader of the plant. This is a leafing branch. This is a fruiting branch. And this, this, and this are suckers. So the easiest and best, best method to prune the suckers out is to catch them when they're small, like this one, which is very small, and you pinch it between your finger and your thumb. Look for them at, at every juncture where a leafing branch goes off of the stem. So here's another one, a little bit bigger. Same technique, pinch out and it's gone. Then uh, if you haven't been uh, diligently uh, pruning, like I haven't this plant, then go and look at the bottom of the plant and you'll often see suckers coming off the base right at the soil line. Same technique, pinch it, So then later in the season, this grows so fast that sometimes you miss a sucker and it turns into a second leader. This is the second leader coming off of this plant. Here is another one. These are too big to pinch. So I have to bring out my rusty, my, <laughs> my trusty pruners, snip it as close to the juncture as you can. Now you have your back to your central leader. The last thing to do after you've gotten rid of all those suckers is to go near the bottom and look for discolored leaves or yellow leaves and pinch them off too. Once, the, once these leaves have turned color, they're not going to be productive for the plant. And you can clear the stem and promote better air circulation. Now we're done with this plant until next week when there will be new leaders, I mean new <laughs> suckers coming out between the leaf 
branch and the stem. Um, and then the point here is, um, I came up as an earlier question for someone who was on early, is that you'll see leaves and branches at the bottom of the plant turn yellow. Sometimes it's that uh, uh, early blight. Sometimes it's just because there's so many green leaves above this uh, yellow stem is that the plant has decided it doesn't need that those leaves that stem anymore. So rule of thumb, anything turns yellow or brown on your tomato, prune it off. It's never going to be green again. Only the new stuff is green. Uh, and make sure you remove the pruned material because you never know if it is got the fungus. Don't put it in the compost pile. Don't leave it near your tomato plant. Get rid of it. Either bag it or throw it in the woods or whatever you can do. Just keep it away from the healthy tissue on your plants. All right. So a couple points on this. It's better to eat or process your ripe tomatoes as soon as possible. Most of us keep our refrigerators at 40. I went and checked. My, my refrigerator is at 40. And my experience with keeping ripe tomatoes in the refrigerator is they tend to lose their flavor pretty fast. So I recommend that uh, you plan accordingly and use your ripe tomatoes as soon as you can, either process or eat them. Or give them to your neighbor. Make new friends. And next year, don't grow so many plants that you have too many tomatoes when they all ripen at the same time. And now we're getting into the end of the year. So now we're, we're at least in front of things. So uh, there was a movie about fried green tomatoes, not something I like, but I do have a tip here is that late in the season, if you pick the last green tomatoes before that dreaded night where it's gonna frost for the first time, you can put them in a closed brown paper bag. Tomatoes give off ethylene gas like apples and other uh, fruits and vegetables as a natural bride product and in a closed environment act to ripen green tomatoes. I usually see a 50% success rate with tomatoes that were green when I put them in the bag and when I open the bag a week or two later, they're red. They're not as tasty as vine ripen, but it's better than nothing as the nights get cold and another gardening season comes to an end. So here's a couple of resources for you. Again, the whole presentation is available online. So you don't have to write this down. Ah, diseases and problems. Blossom and rot. Um, some of my fruit this year are exhibiting this due to that mini drought we just endured in late June and early July. It's best to discard these damaged fruits, though if you are dedicated and after they ripen, you can cut off the black and bottom and use the top but they are, as you see, pretty ugly. But all that red stuff on that picture, that's all good. That's all good to eat. But if you have lots of good fruit, you don't need to keep these. Add them to the compost pot. Because it's not a, this is not a, a disease caused by a fungus or, or, a, or anything else. This is just a water issue or lack thereof. So on this one, uh, the last bullet point, it's really about spring or fall. You can't really add organic matter once this is happening to your plants this summer. So what it refers to is, is, is adding compost or peat moss or something like that, either in the fall after everything is over or in, in the spring. The idea is that your soil is maybe too clay or too compact and you want to add as much organic material as possible. Yeah, I think of this as mostly a cosmetic problem. It doesn't affect the taste and quality of the fruit if it happens just as the fruit ripens. The cracks appear before the fruit, fruit before the fruit fully ripens. It will provide entrance for pests and diseases and definitely affect the flavor and quality. And it'll rot. So probably best uh, if it's bad. It's probably plenty more coming. But you see the picture on the top right, those, those tomatoes are all usable. But the one on the bottom left, that might be nasty looking by the time you see that. That's a big crack. 
Could be little bugs floating around in the corner. Not a good thing. So, I don't really get the cat facing thing. It doesn't look at all like any of my cats. I think they'd be highly insulted. But seriously, this uh, does happen sometimes due to the uneven rainfall and heat of our summers. Uh, again, if you're dedicated, everything that's colored like that, that's all edible. It doesn't look very nice, but you can cut it up and put it in salads, certainly. Cat facing. Who knew? So, in my experience, this is mostly a sighting issue. Um, and my note here is, uh, it can be weather if it's really cold, but our summers have been pretty hot, so that's really not a major problem. It's probably a sighting issue. And this is a rule of thumb, vegetable gardens like to have six to eight hours of sunlight. So if you're building a new garden or a raised bed, make sure you're looking at, uh, before you plant or before you put it there, you know, monitor that sunlight on that site because you, especially a tomato, they're tropical plants and they, they want that sunlight. So if there is a poor fruit set, it's more likely that it's a sighting issue. Though so there are other points there too, too much nitrogen, dry soil, but that's a watering issue, which we've covered already. So this is what I've been referring to. That's what you're looking for on the bottom uh, leaves and branches of your plant. And you wanna prune all that off. This problem is all too common in every garden. Once it's in the garden soil, it will return every year. As I've mentioned, preventative measures include crop rotation, leaving the garden fallow for a year or two. But what tomato craving gardener can do that? And spraying all of the leaf surfaces with a copper-based fungicide solution. Once the plant begins to exhibit leaf spot, you can combat by pruning off the leaves and branches that exhibit leaf spotting and discoloration. Uh, ruthlessness is called for here. Prune off the entire branch, even if only a few of the leaves have begun spotting. Uh, my wife had a question on if you do use a, a, a copper spray. Uh, it's not really poisonous, but you don't really want to spray where there are um, ripening fruits. So this is the fungal spray is used in July before things are really getting uh, ripe. But uh, my plants were exhibiting the leaf spotting and the yellowing as early as mid-July, long before any ripening was taking place. So the fungal spray does act to uh, reduce the, the progress of the disease. Tomato hornworms. Not everybody gets these, but they're, they're nasty. Uh, it's important to know the ecology of our insects, both pests and beneficials. This knowledge enables you to take appropriate actions. You can use BT, a spray that can be used, uh, but it can also kill beneficial insects, so you have to be very careful. The pupae, which is that in intermediate stage of the hornworm, uh, overwinters in the soil, so it could also be beneficial to rotate your crop, which we've covered. These are beneficials that are attracted to hornworm, notably a parasitic wasp. Also, looking for eggs on the underside of leaves and hand-picking hand hornworms are tried and true methods. These guys are immense for a caterpillar, and the, but they're, they're really well camouflaged and they're not easy to find when they're small. If you haven't noticed minor defoliation from them, there will come a day when you see every leaf on the top of your plant eaten down to a nub. It breaks your heart. <laughs> you remove them immediately to save the plant, but they're gigantic, so squeezing them is not a good thing. Sometimes when you find them, you will see the top of the hornworm studded with little white dots. These are the eggs of a parasitic wasp that will hatch and eat their way into and through the hornworm. Think alien. You should let these infected hornworms stay where they are. They are doomed and more generations of hornworm parasites is always a good thing. Besides, once the hornworm is being eaten, it also stops eating your, horn, your tomato plant. This is review for the most part, because we are at the end of the presentation. Um, covered watering, environmental issues are important, you know, how you're planting, what, how you're maintaining. Curling leaves didn't come up, so if you have that, here's some answers on that. Leaves turning yellow, we've certainly covered
covered that in a lot of detail. And the wilt diseases is back on that slide as well. So um, I'd also like to put in a plug for those who love to learn about gardening and want to help their communities grow. The online application process for the University of Rhode Island's Master Gardening Program core training runs June to November 1st each year for acceptance, for acceptance into the core training, which runs every spring. Find more details on our website in June. And then, more gardening resources for you. Don't forget to, uh, Kate has said, she'll probably come on. Don't forget to complete the online survey. You'll receive an email following the webinar. And we're open for questions and answers. Hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'm sure everyone is clapping, Tom. That was great. <laughs> um, so before we do some questions and answers, I just want to make sure you all see these resources here. So. Um, if you navigate to that URL, there are a bunch of gardening resources on our Master Gardener program page that are relevant to home gardeners. Um, a lot of a lot of different stuff there, including the Rhode Island Planting Calendar, which is a really wonderful resource uh, that you can use to make sure you put seeds or seedlings in the ground at the right time, which Tom talked about. Um, also, we actually have a hotline that when we're not in a pandemic, real live people sit at and answer the phone. You can call, um, but right now they're not there physically. So you can send an email with photographs to gardener at uri.edu. So if some of you asked a question we don't get to, feel free to send it um, to gardener at uri.edu and someone will get back to you within three business days. What a, what a service, huh? And then um, we will continue to have webinars uh, into the future every Tuesday at seven, beginning at, in September and for August, Friday at noon, just check our website and you can always email us at coopex.uri.edu. So we'll leave these um, resources up and I'm going to ask you, Tom, a couple questions that I didn't respond to. So one thing, um, folks, is if you're still with us here, there is a Q&A box and people have been typing in great <laughs> questions. Some I've answered with some um, cooperative extension resources. So check out the links that I've sent. And I also would encourage you to um, use the e-extension search tool. I will put a link to that in the search box, but what that, search tool does is it allows you to put your question in and it's only going to return answers that come from uh, a cooperative extension service so that you know they'll be science-based they're not um you know not vetted basically um i'll leave it at that so tom someone was asking about um how tall your cages were and I, I think this the answer to this depends on the person, but um, how tall are yours? All right, well, as, as I said, a lot of things I've evolved over time. And once I began to really work on the technique of a central leader and making the plant tall and increasing the fruits, um, most of the tomato cages you see, the square ones are about three feet, three and a half feet. But um, the ones I have gotten, and um, they're available online from various vendors, um, they go almost six feet. And uh, the cherry tomatoes come out the top, and then they start falling down the sides. So and <laughs> tomatoes will go 10, 12 feet, uh, given, given the opportunity to do so. It's like a cherry tomato waterfall. It's not bad. Yeah, no, you can reach them. <laughs> yeah, not a terrible thing. How about our friend Karen asks, how do you water with plastic mulch? I direct, well, it, these are too far from my hose. So I use a watering can uh, filling from my rain, my rain barrel, or if that's empty, which it was there for a couple of weeks, I fill the watering can and I go over and I water right at the base of the plant. Remember, I've, I've laid two pieces of red plastic on either side. I haven't enclosed the stem, so there's a slit in between those two pieces of red plastic mulch, and 
the water will go in there and feed the roots. And that's important too, if you visualize put, you know, we don't usually talk much about putting plastics or fabric down um, because a lot of times that if it's not installed right, it can prevent water from getting through. The other important thing, especially with plastic, is making sure that the root flare, so the part of the plant that starts to go like this, there are all pores there and oxygen needs to be able to get in and out. So that's a great question, Karen. And I think, you know, as Tom said, you have to be careful when you install that stuff because water and air is very important airflow through. Um, Lots of questions about green tomato. Someone asked, <laughs> which is fun. Alan said green tomato relish is great for end season, which I will be trying. But some folks were asking about, um, you know, my, my tomatoes just aren't turning green. And I looked up a resource and it seems as though that's a direct result of the temperature. So it's been very, very hot here. <laughs> Um, and, you know, tomato, uh, all plants are stressed in those times. So does that sound right that it, that we just have to hang on? <laughs> I was going to say, I think patience is a virtue here. And I don't generally expect to get ripe tomatoes until August. So I'm comfortable. Mine are all green. I haven't seen any red on any of mine yet, but they're coming. They're growing bigger every day. Then really, believe me, unless there's something weird about the weather, by August, you'll be saying, what do we do with all these ripe tomatoes? <laughs> so then all of you should check out our um, our putting up food webinars that we'll be having with, with some of our colleagues. Um, Mickey asked, my tomato grew tall, but has very few flowers. What can I do to fix this? Does biological hormone spray work? These are tomatoes in containers. Ah, uh, well, uh. Again, it's not, I don't know determinants. Uh, it may, doesn't send any fruit. I, I, I really haven't grown them. The indeterminates have lots and lots of fruit. So it's possible it's a determinant type plant and it's only going to make a few um, fruit. Uh, but otherwise, I'm not sure. So Mickey, you can send that question into the hotline. I think if the, like Tom said, the, the tomato is determined it's going to set fruit at the top and it's going to set a lot all at once so patience might be the the virtue there too um on that note though about patience tom it someone asked if um if the plant is turning yellow if if there are yellow leaves is there a point at which you should pull the plant out to prevent things from colonizing in the soil if you leave the plant there um if if it's the uh early blight it's already in the soil it's in the plant so the pulling it out at some point is not going to work but um as long as the plant is producing new green shoots and new green leaves at the top prune off the yellow and you know hopefully you can you can outlast by getting the fruit before the plant dies but yeah eventually if the plant will die from this. All, all the leaves on their way from the bottom up to the top will turn yellow. But again, some of it is you get rid of the yellow and the brown as fast as you can. And if it's if it is the early blight, I've had good success with this copper-based fungicide. And but you have to spray the underside of the leaves and the top of the leaves, and um, you have to be diligent about it. Get it all because it will spread. So Phil's asking some, Phil Fong, our great friend, is asking some chemistry-related questions. And, and just because we're all friends here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail Tom with a couple of these. So um, Phil's asking, are there any elements that affect the taste of tomatoes while they're ripening, and when would you apply this? So in other words, asking if there's a particular type of... Uh, nutrient or element that might make a tomato taste better? I, I don't know the answer and uh, full disclosure, chemistry was not a subject <laughs> in high school I looked back to with any great um, uh, favor. So uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, the only one that the, the element per se that was mentioned in the um, uh, presentation was calcium. 
about blossom end rot and putting calcium in. Obviously, that's going to make the fruit taste better if it gets the sufficient amount of calcium. But I think if you have decent soil, um, you don't really need to do that. But hotline question. Yeah, these are these are stumpers, Phil. I think um, uh, an thing is being really careful when you choose the variety of tomato based on what the description says about how it tastes. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of a more hands off gardener in general. I think things have evolved and we've bred them to do certain things and, and a good description on a seed packet or from a plant sale tells you a lot about what to expect. So um, less is more sometimes. Lee is asking a really great question about identifying determinant versus indeterminate when plants are small because he has some mystery <laughs> mystery plant. Well, the, the indeterminate uh, plant will start to sucker uh, at, at a foot or, or less. It, it starts very fast. Sometimes when you buy them, they'll have suckers on them. So uh, the suckers are your, are your marker. If, if they have them, it's indeterminate. If they don't, they're determinate. And generally those are, because I'm learning this too, at a 45 degree angle to the main stem, right? Always, if they're small. But like you and I talked about, if you miss one that's growing out of the stem, say it, it, it's up at the top, uh, I illustrated this for you. So you've got a central leader going up and your sucker will go off like at 45 degrees above the leafing branch. But if you've missed this and now that leader is way out to here, the whole plant will start to form a Y. So there'll be two leaders and they'll go in different directions. And then that becomes more difficult to prop up because it wants to go in that, that, that new sucker is almost a 90 degrees at that point. So you want to get them early. And it, it, it's almost every day that you have to go out and look. And believe me, I check them and the day or two later I go out and say, ah, where did that come from? They, they come very fast and it's easy to miss, especially when the plant gets big and there's a lot of foliage. But you look for um, look for the leaving, le leafy branches coming up next to your central leader. Uh, the fruiting branches with the flowers tend to go off at a, uh, a 90 degree angle off the stem. But the, the suckers that turn into leaders, they're gonna go straight up like the plant. Yeah, I found as a new vegetable gardener that being out there every day on the level <laughs> with each plant can help a lot because there's a lot you can observe. Um, a lot of folks are asking about, you know, how to how to encourage more fruit. I mean, I think that's a loaded question. It's kind of a, you know, going back to the first slide in the presentation, making sure the plant has enough sun. Um, making sure it's being watered at around the same time every day, proper soil treatment, making sure soil tests are done. Um, that side dressing too. If, if it's not, if not performing the way you want, you can try side dressing. And that's sprinkling. Scratch the soil in a circle around the, the main stem, sprinkle a little bit of your fertilizer around, cover, cover it back up with soil and water it in. So we haven't had too many questions about pests um, or rodents or varmints, but Ed is asking what's your advice for dealing with or deterring chipmunks. Um, my local rodents have a knack for eating tomatoes, which are a day or two away from ideal harvest time for humans. This question goes for other. <laughs> yeah. Obviously fencing, but again, the method that I'm suggesting growing a tall central leader and getting that fruit high up Chipmunks don't fly, so it's going to be difficult to, for them to get to the higher fruit. So that's my suggestion. Grow up high. If, if you can't really block them and they're in there, then the ones that they'll go after the low hanging fruit. <laughs> Where's my symbol? Um, okay, so we'll, do, we'll do a couple more here. This is a lot of fun. Diane's asking when you're using the cages, do you do you tie or adhere the branches to the, the sides of the cages or just thread them through the cage? The latter. I do not tie them. Yeah, so that's a that's an almost daily every other day activity, just seeing how 
the plant is growing, you know, you have to be really careful when you get a branch underneath the cage if it's grown too far out. But the cages do hold them up in my experience really well. Yep. Okay, that was an easy one. Um, and a great question. Kelly's asking, are there plants that should never be planted near tomatoes? N not to my knowledge. I have never had, you know, a loss of a tomato that I attributed to a nearby plant. It's possible. I, I, I think that falls into that category of companion planting, right? So, you know, the science on that is not clear. Um, so the answer is, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah, so uh, we want to get rid of weed. Let me. So I just put. Um, I'm going to put that the link to that that extension.org site, so you all can a put questions into that search and make sure you're getting science-based answers. And then I'm sure you all wrote down gardener at uri.edu, which our volunteers will really appreciate us <laughs> promoting that. Uh, resource so you can always ask questions and someone will get back to you. I think the question, um, the last question we can answer for everyone is uh, they want to know your favorite kinds of tomatoes to plant. Uh, for paste, I, I plant San Marzano, but frankly, because I'm a master gardener, I can take advantage of the master gardening plant sale resources. So. If they, don't, if they haven't been growing San Marzano or other out, then another paste tomato will do. Roma is the one that you often see. So Roma, San Marzano are the paste tomatoes. There are tons of different uh, cherry tomatoes. I like to grow uh, uh, two or three. Uh, and you see them in farmer's markets too. They like to do that too. They, they give you those nice little baskets with multicolor tomatoes, but the sweet 100 is good. Um, I had an orange one last year. I can't remember the name of it, but that was really good. The black cherry series are delicious as well. And they come in different sizes, but so I've seen uh, cherry tomatoes in black, uh, black, purpley black, uh, orange and red. Um, Sweet 100 is the standard for red. Um, I can't remember the name of the, of the orange one, but they're out there. You'll see them. They're common. And then for Sun gold, Sun gold. Mm -hmm. that, I think you've got it. And then uh, I like an orange tomato, so the persimmon works well for slicing. There are so many different red slicers to pick from, Rutgers, Big Boy, there's tons of them. Um, but sometimes the Big Boys and the Rutgers get so big that they're, I mean, I like that, that nice sliceable one for my BLTs and such. So um, I try not to get the ones that really are gonna get gigantic. I, I don't wanna grow an award-winning giant tomato. I want to grow a useful tomato. Well, I hope this um, helped folks. We had a great group of people asking great questions and um, folks are saying, thank you very much, Tom. You're welcome. Wonderful. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Please spread the word to your friends and family that the University of Rhode Island has a great service called Cooperative Extension and there is a lot of information available to you for free through our resources, um, including this webinar series. And so I think we all have some work to do this afternoon. I'm gonna get out in the garden right now. Tom, I look forward to seeing you again and thanks everyone for being here today. Bye. Stay healthy.